So I'll start by giving a brief agenda for today's talk. Uh, we'll start by giving a brief uh, intro about the product folks and also intro about Nirali's profile. So product folks is basically a volunteer driven community of product managers and product enthusiasts. So we are a bunch of people who came together to help uh, the community grow together. So we have a bunch of initiatives. Uh, firstly, Learn PM with me, which is a bunch of curated resources meant to upskill you in the field of product management. Uh, Insurger.club, which is an early stage APM program. We also have monthly events with senior PM where we learn from them and the products they are working on. So over to introducing the speaker for today, we have with us Nirali Shah. She had had stints with Amazon Prime and Book My Show. So Nirali, I'm very excited to learn from your journey into product management and also especially, especially today's topic. So over to you, Nirali. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. You're the okay, cool. How's everyone doing today? Saturday afternoon. <laughs> Sorry, everyone's it's, muted. Yeah. Everyone's muted. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, let me just quickly dive into this. I'll give a brief introduction. I'll just share my slides as well. Um, I will need permission. Yash. Oh, uh, one second. Yes, I have the permissions. Thanks. Can you see my screen? Yeah, it's visible there. Okay, great. So uh, today we want to kind of talk about learning from failures as a PM. Um, I am Nirali Shah. Hi, a little bit about myself. Uh, I started my career as a software engineer, as I think most of you. And uh, I worked with Cisco in the US for uh, five and a half years. Uh, advanced my career as a tech lead there. I got an opportunity to shadow my product managers while I was working uh, with uh, the product WebEx Social. And uh, that's when I got really excited to kind of, you know, uh, uh, take up this role as my profession. And uh, I, uh, that's when I also moved back to India. And that was a good time for me to transition from uh, engineering to product management. And since then, I have worked uh, with a couple of nascent state startups, uh, then Book My Show, and uh, most recently with Amazon Prime Video Team. So that has been pretty much my career in a nutshell. Um, today, we want to kind of talk about uh, what my learnings have been uh, through some of the failures, successes, uh, and as well as see what, uh, in general, we can kind of learn from um, the failures that we face. Uh, let's dive into this straight. Okay, so why do we talk about this topic today, right? So generally we've heard about like people talking about their successes, they like, okay, this is what we did, this product was successful, we achieved this and that. But I thought it was interesting to kind of take a pause and think about, okay, what have been our failures, right? Why uh, do we wanna kind of, what have we learned from it? So people generally do not want to kind of talk about their failures. And as product managers, we've seen that that, you know, we, we take the risk and, you know, we fail all the time. It's part of our job, right? So uh, we've seen that, like, there are many, many learnings on not what to do and what to do as compared to, like, you know, when there are successes. And especially given in, like, in the Indian society, failure is always kind of considered very negative, right from our academics to competitions. And hence, like, when we reach our professional career, uh, we are geared to think to, like, not make any mistake. And, and have the fear of like that failing and thus like we actually avoid taking risks as well. But if you think more about it, every failure kind of teaches you something that we wouldn't have learned otherwise. Like uh, not like from courses or even like 
you know reading and stuff it's it's through these experiences that we kind of learn and it's not just your own failures but even like we can learn from the others in the industry right so moving on let, let's see what we have for today like what is our agenda so we'll go through some industry examples uh, and uh, where big products have failed uh, my my set uh, my own kind of product story where uh, or one of my products failed or my learnings through that how to kind of deal with that failure and then finally looking at um, like how to can we lower the chances of uh, failure here okay so uh, we all kind of know yes there are few products and there's like a lot many examples but you know products that google and amazon have failed too so let's look at the first one here google glass like we everybody's heard about this product so it was one of the most hyped technologies that uh, surprisingly flopped like i had heard so many people talking about it before even it was like, accessible um and uh, if if you guys remember there was this google io conference where that person kind of jumped from the helicopter wearing that google glass and then you know there was a live uh, relay happening in actually the conference and he jumped onto the moscone center where uh, the google glass uh, launch was happening and stuff so it, it like look at that whole hype and marketing that happened and but if you think about it like yeah it flopped why because was there even like a real problem that they were trying to solve right and this goes back to the question of defining the target user the product was probably created based on untested solutions for a problem and target market that was not probably validated right they assume that product would like sell itself even without real solutions or value and that its hype would probably be enough to uh, appeal to everyone and it also had like the privacy issues of you know will it be like kind of socially accept uh, acceptable where you know is, is that person come continuously kind of recording me right so so bunch of things there uh, but then yes i think there was a conflict in terms of what the target audience here what is our user and then uh, eventually it didn't work out the other example here is uh, google plus i think everybody has used google plus they had just got ev all the google users uh, onto onboarded into google plus but what what was the reason why probably that failed i think that's that was like a competitive stunt to facebook and twitter where they tried to be in the middle of like trying to be twitter where you have the following relationship and then being facebook as well where you have like these circles uh, where you have a close knit of uh, friends and family so there was this asymmetrical relationship but confused with uh, also the circles uh, relationship so i think that's where like the, it, it wasn't probably what the users needed but they just wanted to kind of create this whole uh, ecosystem where they competing with uh, facebook and twitter and and like it was there was joke like oh, it's a ghost town that you know everyone is connected but like there's there's void like when you talk there's like no one to kind of you know uh, hear back um so so that was uh, the google plus product uh, failure and the other one here to talk about is amazon's fire phone right so that was one of the like big losses that amazon had they lost almost like 170 million dollars uh, when they uh, uh, after a fire phone was launched so it was it was never made uh, thinking from the customers needs it was more of a need for amazon like as they wanted like competitive advantage over google and apple but uh, thinking from a consumer's point of view customers they were happy with what they had and uh, it wasn't that they couldn't use amazon uh, you know web website or amazon's products uh, without like having an amazon phone so there was no clear differentiation there and also like to uh, solve other problems that amazon had like you know they they would run into problems like 30% cut that they have to give to apple when you know in terms of in app sales and stuff so they wanted to kind of reduce that churn on their end and hence there was fire phone which didn't really work so these are just three products but uh, there are a bunch of examples uh, uh, in the industry that have failed so moving on to uh, what my story is. so uh, while uh, i was at book my show um, we built uh, an in app messaging feature so essentially we were trying to um, 
solve a problem statement where we wanted to make our planning journey of users when they want to basically book movie tickets. Uh, we saw that they were spending a lot of time planning before that. And that had a lot of back and forth uh, communication between like people, what show time to go uh, for what venue, what movie. And then, um, sorry, I'm just getting, we are unable to see her screen on the chat. I'm able to see it on mine. Okay, fine. Okay, so um, so yeah, so so that was a problem statement that you know there was a lot of uh, um, like back and forth from let's say if people are using WhatsApp to plan and then there's book my show and then you know kind of uh, switch back and forth uh, to within the apps. So we wanted to solve that problem and also from a business point of view, we were thinking that you know that will bring an engagement to book my show like. Traditionally, Bookmysh is considered as a utility app where, you know, you could just come when you have kind of figured out everything and then uh, only for ticket, uh, buying your tickets. So we wanted to get that whole journey of planning onto Bookmysh show so that we can increase the frequency of uh, the visits in the app and also the time spent on the app. Uh, we started with this hypothesis, the assumptions that we made were that, you know, all the users will have the app. Uh, it's a huge pain point that we're trying to solve because, you know, uh, planning was cumbersome and is cumbersome. So we went ahead with like a MVP uh, scoped out where we had the hygiene features of all the chat that would like a chat would require a group chat, one-on-one -on -one chat, and, uh, and also had some uh, unique pieces which were geared towards planning in terms of, you know, uh, the user interface, uh, the experience where you could kind of vote for what showtime, what venue and movies, and uh, then you can book through the same kind of uh, seamlessly through the same journey. And uh, we launched it and then uh, we saw really good adoption for the first three months. Uh, we saw that our, our early adopters, the promoters were actually using it. They saw value in it. And suddenly after three months, it started plateauing. Right. And, and uh, as it started plateauing, we deep dived into the data and uh, it was just kind of not aligning to what our success metrics were, uh, especially given with engagement. And then we had to kind of, you know, uh, decide to pivot there and take the feature down. So I'll talk more about why. But this was the whole journey of, you know, uh, we, I think we spent six months building it and then there were, it was six months uh, that we, um, it was there in production uh, life on my show. So what can we learn actually? So why would it fail uh, when we had kind of, you know, done our MVP uh, and then we launched with, you know, the features, right? We had the problem statement, everything, uh, which was kind of working out for us for our business opportunity that we had behind it. So the first thing is, assume nothing and listen to customers, right? So we've heard this a lot that, you know, we should always listen to your customers, do your qualitative, quantitative research, feedback and stuff. But I think uh, a lot of assumptions that we make uh, as product managers, we have to kind of, you know, make sure that's backed with data, right? So, so we all make our best estimates, guesses on the information we have and how we perceive that information. Uh, as it pertains to the market and our products. And it's true that product managers have to anticipate like what the customers want before they even realize, but it has to be based on data. Without customer interviews, feedback, like any decisions that's like based on assumptions, it's pretty much like you're really playing with fire, right? So so basically assumptions should be very well tested. Uh, in, our, in Chad's case, uh, uh, the messaging feature that we had built, the assumption was that everybody will have an app, which was not true which we realized late that, you know, uh, when we deep dive into data, data that 50% of our users actually did not uh, have an app. And that's why people were not kind of being able to have a two-way communication, right? Uh, also, the other thing is customer research before building. So we, so like doing a prototype and kind of showing it to the customers, ha having them like do like a particular task. Is it okay for them? Is the friction that they are like right now already using let's say WhatsApp or any other tool to kind of make their plans and then, you know, switching to this, how big of a friction is it for the users? And eventually listening to your customers and not your competitors, right? So this is not pertaining to like chat per se, but like in general, right? Like, uh, and Amazon does it really well, where uh, it's, it's not trying to see what, you know, other competitors are doing, but just trying to see what their users are needing. And, and that's a, there's a very uh, nice quote uh, from Sam Walton where, if you don't listen to your customers, someone else will. So the second one here is, you know, uh, validate early on. Like the time like spent 
early on validating with the team, uh, the focus groups or our users means less time kind of, you know, reworking down the line. Uh, especially like, you know, uh, you can kind of differentiate if you're building a vitamin versus a painkiller. Uh, I like this analogy where it means that it's, it, are you building like a good to have versus a must have? Because a lot of times, like even for chat, it, the adoption was really good. But then uh, it started to plateau and kind of decline because yes, it was a good to have, but you can't sustain if it's not a must have feature, right? So people would resort back to their old mechanisms the way they were doing it if there was not something that was really a value add for them, right? So, so hence, you know, is it solving a real problem? So what we identified with chat was that maybe it was not a very big problem for them. Right. Uh, they were happy with what they were doing and there was a very high friction for them to kind of, you know, get on to something, uh, a different chat interface. There's a, there's a learning curve there and also kind of getting all their friends. I think the biggest one is getting all your, you know, network onto a new platform um, or like book my show. And this is also one of the problems, uh, sorry, for um, Google Class as well, where uh, it would have been more successful, you know, if its designers had done their market research to validate um, their users, the problem they were trying to solve, um, you know, and the solutions that Google Glass would kind of provide. The other thing is like building a minimum lovable product. This is again something I learned at uh, Amazon where, you know, uh, in this competitive world out there, people only have a short attention span, right? So you might only get one chance. So, so you have to make it count, right? So, so minimum viable product is something that I think is outdated now where let's say you're just going with like a very minimum uh, version of it or probably like, you know, not having uh, the ideal UX and uh, just having the functionality that you want to kind of validate and test. But give it like if it's your first chance you're launching it, you have to really look at the trade-off where you do one thing, but really well in terms of, UX, uh, like it not being an afterthought there and also have your differentiation in the first launch itself, right? So that's where you want to build like a minimum lovable product an MLP where it's loved by your customers and it's not just a viable product there. And guys, if you have any questions, I think you can just post it on the chat and then we'll take it later on. That will be... Okay, so the next one is like, um, how do you deal with failure? So let's say all this has happened, you've realized that, okay, you know, something that we have to take it down. The first thing is, you know, accept, learn and move on, right? So much like being a founder, the product manager role is uh, one where you require mental toughness, right? You're constantly making big decisions uh, and your colleagues and customers are counting on you. So no matter how great of a product manager you are, it's inevitable that you're going to experience failure at some point, right? So, so accept, learn, and move on. If you made a mistake, face it and adapt to it. You won't be able to like make up for the lost time, but um, it's, it's, it's vital to kind of truly understand why something went wrong, but it's just as important to know like when to move on and you know, uh, walk away. So, so that's very important. And the second thing is acknowledge the who and the why, but focus on what. So this is something that I read where, uh, you know, it's um, um, like you want to kind of deep dive and, you know, like blame that, oh, you know, it's because of marketing, it's because of design, it's because of product manager, it's because of engineering. But then, yeah, it's good to know what, who, what could have been like done better, who could have done better and why as well. But what is like, okay, now what next, right? So yes, we've identified this and we've seen that a lot of times we just leave the features there because it's, oh, it's my baby as a product manager and we don't want to kind of get rid of that feature. Uh, we've spent so much time, but uh, yes, you have to make like, kind of hard decisions and say that, yes, it does not make sense for this feature to be here and then we should kind of take it down. So one good thing that we did while, uh, we, uh, while we were working on this product chat was, you know, having an on off switch there where uh, it wasn't like an extra effort to uh, again, uh, kind of turn it off and stuff. So, so we had like this switch where, you know, if you just turned it off, uh, the feature would kind of not be there. Like the icon on the product itself would kind of disappear. It also helps actually in the other scenarios where let's say something is really uh, going wrong and then uh, you want to kind of just take it down because maybe uh, uh, there's some uh, 
performance issues or some, some bugs there. Right. And the last thing, which is also extremely important is communicate, right? So, so communicate, communicating problems like early and uh, proactively is, is very key here. And when I say communicate, it's not just about communicating like to your stakeholders, but also kind of communicating to, uh, you know, uh, your colleagues, which is, let's say, your engineering team, your design team, your marketing team, who, have, who has also kind of worked with you for, uh, before your product, right? So kind of trying to get everyone's, uh, you know, buy-in, or more than a buy I would say, like, everybody to kind of understand what went wrong and, you know, uh, kind of moving on from there. And yes, failure is not a reflection of one's abilities, right? So a lot of times when we are very like new in our product management career, and I myself, like I felt really bad that, oh, should I kind of, you know, do it like I shouldn't have been done. I should have done this, that. And a lot of times we feel that way. But uh, I think it's, it's not a reflection of one's abilities, but it's more of, okay, you know, I would review the decisions taken. If I made a good decision, given the information, uh, I had available at that moment, uh, I would rest in peace, right? So a lot of times you have to kind of take those guesstimates. And I think it's more than that, I would like think of it as having a growth mindset, right? Like it's, it's failure is an opportunity to grow. So like you failure as like a starting point for experimentation and, you know, testing of new ideas. Uh, it's basically to have that passion for learning and improving themselves and, you know, like your team. Uh, and also like, you know, embracing challenges, like it's to try, strive for continuous improvements and never give up. So, so a lot of times in our early career, we feel like, uh, oh, um, you know, I probably am not a good product manager, but I think uh, if we take failure as an opportunity, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's more of a positive than, you know, a, a negative there. This is an interesting thing uh, about Amazon here, uh, where, you know, um, uh, I don't know if you guys know about it, but Amazon has this two-way door decisions uh, where uh, it, it, they have like one-way door, which is basically a decision if you walk through and if you don't like what you see on the other side, you can't get back, right? So it's an irreversible decision. Uh, why, whereas a two-way door is if you walk through and you can see what you find and if you don't like it, you can kind of walk right back to the door and return to the state that you had before, right? So that's like a reversible decision. So this basically applies to the same for a product manager while you're kind of deciding and, you know, uh, launching your product that if it's something that you can, uh, that, that you can probably, you know, uh, turn it off or, you know, something that is not going to harm your brand reputation, uh, which is not going to make a uh, clearer damage, which is like, uh, you can't really, it's an irreversible damage. Uh, definitely go for it. And, and most of them are two-way door decisions that we make, right? Uh, there are rarely, or I would say very, very high strategic uh, decisions that you have to take, which are one-way door decisions, right? And, and generally people do this, like uh, just an example is Facebook's dating service. So they started this two years back where they experimented uh, with like a very, uh, I think it was a Columbia University where uh, they just tried this dating service there and then they, eventually kind of, you know, published and launched it in other countries. So, so you're basically trying to scope out and when you have such big launches, uh, which could probably uh, hurt your uh, brand, uh, you kind of test it at a very, very small scale uh, and get feedback and then kind of launch on a larger scale there. Right. And there's this other thing where uh, it's called the COE process uh, in Amazon, which is basically correction of error. Uh, where it, it's you're basically drilling down uh, onto why that happened and like five you ask yourself five times so why that happened oh it happened because of this oh but why that did that happen and then you kind of if once you go like five times down you actually go to your root cause so it's for mainly for root cause analysis and it, it is mainly for uh, also for like errors and bugs and production issues but even for a pm i think it really helps when you try to kind of go uh, five times five levels down on a Y and then that gives you like okay this was the reason that actually caused uh, this particular problem and it's not just a professional PM life but even in your personal life I think it really helps when you kind of beat down five times why so it's quite interesting and our all fav all time favorite build measure learn right so uh, it, it's the way I visualize this like a failure is actually an iteration 
right? So while building a feature, there is a hypothesis that this feature, let's say, for example, will drive engagement. Uh, then you kind of scope out an experiment over a small target audience and, and maybe uh, it didn't work. So it's not really a product failure, but an experiment whose hypothesis was invalidated, right? So you're basically trying to see the minimal impact, like same as what I talked about, the Facebook dating service um, feature. So, so it's similar to that where you're like building, measure, building and then measuring and learning where I think we all kind of work in the agile framework now that it, it gives and promotes that you are, you're trying to build fast and then fail fast and then learn from it. And, and it's more of the experiments nature that you're trying to kind of validate something else. And then it, if it gets invalidated, it's not really a failure, but you know, you kind of learn from it and then you pivot and you try some other experiment that would help. Yeah, and uh, actually I got this slide. I, I thought it was relevant to this kind of uh, topic where, you know, um, since some of you I know are kind of trying to kind of uh, get interviews and also like as an interviewee myself and interviewer, I've got this question a lot of times, you know, like tell us why, uh, when your product has failed. And I know like uh, being on both sides, you kind of just uh, like go, candidates have gone blank. Like, oh, why is he asking me this question? Is it like, oh, I should tell my what my weakness is and stuff, but it, it's not to assess that you are perfect or not. Uh, but it's, they want to test you if you are anti-fragile. And, and this is a term I kind of got from internet, where it's, it's anti-fragile, where it, it, it basically means that they want to kind of bring in someone who uh, do not want to kind of, you know, crumble um, under failure and, you know, who knows how to kind of handle it. Uh, with that gracefulness, that maturity, uh, that wisdom, you know, and that's the whole path for the growth in that organization. So whenever you have this like question, I think uh, prepare it very well because this kind of differentiates you from a good versus a great product manager where uh, it's like you're kind of describing your situation and then you're telling that, you know, what were your learnings and how did you kind of handle it? Uh, and it's, it's a very good way to kind of, you know, position yourself and differentiate yourself from the other candidates. And uh, lastly, so our takeaways from here, uh, I think the first thing is failure is an opportunity uh, to grow if we learn from it. It's, it's not something personal or negative. Uh, always understand the root causes of failures. The main ones, I think, is basically is it solving a real problem. Uh, you know, uh, test your assumptions that uh, you've made. Focus on the what, so what to do kind of next, or more than who. Um, and... Uh, to lower the chances of failure, I think listen to your customers. Uh, that's very, very key. And an experiment. Experimentation is basically key to something that, you know, you're trying to kind of iterate and go to your goal. So that's about it from the thing. I think yeah, I would kind of last leave you with this quote where it says, greatness lies not in never falling, but in rising every time we fall. So I really like this quote. So I thought I'll share it with you guys as well. So thanks a lot, uh, Anil Thank Rani, you. for that for the insights. So I'm pretty sure everyone learned a lot. So just to kick off the Q and A, so one of the questions which I had is, uh, you worked at Book My Show and Amazon Prime. So both are B two C companies, but both are very different in what they do. So what what uh, so what difference in product culture did you notice while working at both these companies, while building products or shipping out products? Like what was the one few things which are different in both the companies? So uh, one very big difference, I would say a lot of uh, time is spent even before uh, the product is kind of even started in execution. A lot of planning uh, and in product management terms, I would say product discovery, uh, right? A lot of time is spent in product discovery. Like, you know, how are we going to, there's this whole PR FAQ process where uh, you kind of write down your press release, how my product is going to launch, what the customer's okay. benefits are. And then there is a FAQ, which is like basically frequently asked questions uh, by your stakeholders, by your customers. And that is kind of drilling down on every single why, that why are we building it? And that actually, uh, as a PM, also makes you think very critically uh, on, um, you know, 
it's it's not very loosely that oh you know we did this research and uh, like every assumption that you're making is basically data backed and that's the biggest uh, difference i saw that you know we were spending a lot of time in planning versus uh, in, in in any startup not just book my show or in, in a mid size company we are always geared towards let's ship it right like right. you know uh, let's we will we'll look at the data once we Ooh. ship it and stuff but i think that uh, from both the experiences what i've learned is that you know uh, yes you do not want to kind of ponder on it like for 6 months uh, but you should give that due time to understand that you know if it makes sense to kind of build it uh, and of course you will have some assumptions you will not have all the data but then yes you will make those informed decisions uh, to the best of the information you have and 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 ship with it so i would say midway somewhere not like plan for 6 months but not like ship in like uh, overnight you think of an idea and let's build it tomorrow right okay so, yeah So we have a question from Praveen. So, any suggestion on how to improve engagement while building products? Ah, uh, improve yes. engagement. Engage. Still very generic, uh, but few things uh, while probably doing uh, building mockups or something like that, which you have come across to focus more on engagement. So, um, just trying to understand the question: engagement with users. Correct. Uh, uh, yeah. While you're building, so what are some key aspects? Mm, so i think it all depends on what your product is actually yeah. right so uh, let's say in case of book my show uh, engagement also would mean different for different products True. right so for i'll just take an example so it's easy to kind of uh, relate to that uh, for book my show we wanted engagement was how much time are you spending on the app how what is your frequency recency of the app yeah. and eventually when you improve your engagement you have your downstream metrics like conversions and everything else kind of improving as well so for uh, for engagement you basically look at how do you make your feature which is more like a habit forming feature now and True. that can be taken yeah. from Neeraj's yeah, all the gyan yeah. from him but uh, it's it's basically how do you have that real value add that the user will come back to you again and again right so could it be gaming in gaming you want to kind of see how you are engaging and he's kind of nudged to kind of come back right a lot of times i've seen engagement really helps uh, when you have a social part to it right so when you have like a social network or it it, it tell it brings you like it, there's a reason for you to kind of come back to it right like otherwise if you think about book my show it's okay it's a fortnightly thing maybe i'm visiting uh, going for a movie or an event let's say twice in a month or once in yeah. a month but then so the challenge that we were trying to solve is that how do we get him more frequent right and how do yeah, we right. increase so think of the ways that what is a more daily need for the user and not like some sparse like for example even for travel right or oh, you'll only go when uh, you have yeah. a travel need yeah, right. but but uh, for example in book my show we actually should, like as an engagement we also build a feature called buzz which was for content where where you are kind of coming for your content needs that okay you know before even making a decision for a movie what are the reviews for that uh, movie what are uh, what are the ratings for that movie or you know if i want to go for an event what are the top 10 things uh, events to see this uh, weekend so th- there are many ways depends on your product but you basically have to think of that key thing that you know how will you get your users uh, more frequent in terms of making that habit for him uh, to come to your product Yeah, so we're getting a lot of questions on the uh, book my show chat feature which you built. So people like to know that uh, uh, what were the success metrics which you had, which you all had in mind uh, while you were building the product, and also what what were one of the top one of the top reasons why it did not uh, why it failed. Hmm. So I think I, that I mentioned in the deck, but okay. So first, so success metrics mainly were. Uh, the whole feature was built around uh, driving engagement so what would be your uh, frequency of the users coming to it so you when you're planning right every time yeah. you're kind of chatting the user will have to come to the app and you know kind of uh, respond to the message so the the big the, the north star metric i would say was the frequency uh, and then that would kind of percolate down to a lot more feature related uh, metrics like one could be number of plans that have a movie uh, that the user has made number of messages the user is sending yeah. uh there could be number of tickets that the user has actually booked so one very key uh, metric that really helped us kind of uh, figure out what the problem was was a response rate and okay. by response rate uh, it means is basically if i'm sending 100 messages i'm getting let's say 10 messages back so 10% is my response rate right. and that helped us deep dive that you know okay why is the response rate so low and then when we kind of actually go 
like drew kind of a decision tree and figured out what the problem is we found that 50 percent of our users didn't have the app then how will you they will respond to it and out of the other 50 which had the app uh, actually uh, did not have notifications on which is also very important for chat uh, as a product to work right so so we build the with iterations, we did a lot of funnel analysis and figured out what other you know uh, problems and uh, build uh, features which would help improve uh, you know uh, the notifications. Uh, users turn the, on their notifications, have their app installs, but then still it wasn't a huge enough uh, need for the user to install the app just because of planning, mm-hmm. right? And also we uh, we realized that you know planning as a behavior is there's like let's say there's a group of five friends there's like one and two person who is like oh let's just go for this and then he'll chat and then everybody's like okay okay but not everybody has to have an app that's only one person who kind of you know goes and then says okay everything done let's go for the showtime venue and uh, this movie and then he would go back to book my show and then chat uh sorry book the ticket so so when you see this like uh, when we actually saw it in production the people the way they were using it we realized that okay we are solving a problem for one person right like in that group and not for everyone and that person yeah. would anyways come to the app to book the ticket so so that i think the assumptions i think that we made the main reason i would say the assumptions that we had made were busted uh that you know it will kind of uh, like people having the app and stuff and of course the huge the, the real problem that we were seeing uh, solving that it wasn't a huge friction for the users to kind of you know switch back and forth i think the friction was to install the app correct so yeah so yeah so as you mentioned decision tree uh, like uh, is one of the frameworks which you all use to break down uh, uh, to see if the product is successful or not so we had a few questions are there any other frameworks which uh, you have used uh, to, uh, to basically analyze the metrics of any product like more such frameworks mm, so honestly i haven't used i mean as such any frameworks it's just mainly logic in terms mm-hmm. of uh, yeah, right. you you start with let's say okay this is this is my success metric and when you kind of uh, deep dive into okay what is is it like a geography problem is it a target audience problem is it any uh, since it was an only app thing so but then you can there are many ways you can dissect the data uh, mm-hmm. uh, given like a problem statement there so i think there's uh, i would I, I don't think there's like any framework probably there could be many but mm-hmm. not that i have used yeah so I think uh, there's one more question from Meher. Uh, can you highlight few things which you uh, were like as a young product manager and now as a matured product manager? Like the differences while making decisions or mm. communication? Many actually. I think as when we are raw as product manager, we are always, and depends on what of course the, what your background is, right? Like as, let's say for example, as an engineer, a lot of times we want to kind of quickly jump onto solutions, right? Oh, let's just solve this, right? So that's something that I've learned like over the time that, you know, think through completely. Uh, a lot of times we just, you know, say that, oh, this will work. And uh, just in terms of details, depth, uh, also like questioning ourselves why every time, does it make sense? Does this make sense? Uh, that's the first one. The second one, I think, is also kind of making more collaborative decisions. So a lot of times as PM, you feel, oh, it's just my responsibility to mm-hmm. do this, right? Uh, which I've learned over the time that, no, it's, it's yes, you are kind of the driver, but it really helps when you're kind of collaborating with everyone. Like, and, and when I say everyone, it's mainly like, your, let's say, your engineering lead or your uh, design lead, your marketing lead. If it's a B2B product, it's a sales lead. And you all are kind of working together in that whole product discovery phase uh, to brainstorm and solutionize because um, like more than often I've seen that, you know, they come up with the brightest ideas and, you know, and they will kind of question on those edge cases and maybe an engineering person says, Hey, but you know, this will probably not work. And, and instead of figuring out like down the line when you're almost in your like 10th sprint, it's better yeah. to get that, uh, you know, uh, chalked out in your initial product discovery itself. So uh, yeah, that's, I see that as a big difference there. So as you mentioned, the collaborative effort. So we have a question that how do you make uh, the developer and the product manager communication more efficient? Like how can both help each other build the right product? Like what are the few things while you're communicating to the design team or the develop development team to have in mind? Mm, from communication perspective, uh, I think talking in their language really helps. So uh, especially let's say if, um, it will be very easy for you if, if you're an engineer yourself, Ooh, but, yes. but it, and it, it's true for even, let's say your business counterpart, right? So when you kind of talk uh, to a bigger business counterpart in their language that, oh, this is the metric we are moving. This is the money you will be get, like you'll be getting right. into this. 
uh, it, it straight away goes into their head, right? It so the same thing. Yeah, I mean, you're basically talking in the language they would understand, right. and the same thing for uh, for engineering and design as well. Like, for like, it's you're showing the empathy towards them that yes, I understand this problem, uh, and you know, I think that's like building that trust together. Uh, like, okay, we are all kind of working towards the same goal, having that vision uh, in mind, uh, really helps to kind of keep everybody motivated as well uh, uh, in the team. And from like purely communication point of view, I think it's uh, in an agile world, we generally have our stand-ups and also like people working in squads. So uh, it wouldn't be a barrier unless now we are doing remote working where we have more meetings then. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, but I think uh, it's very, very important to have that transparent communication uh, if, if the engineering team feels some other way and the product manager. And I've seen a lot of times you have to trade off as well. It's not that you can always listen to your designer uh, where, uh, okay, let's just make this fancy thing, but oh, it will take probably three months to build it. And that's a very, uh, for a product manager, it gets very tricky and, and uh, extremely critical to kind of make those trade offs between, yes, we have to kind of balance both a design and engineering here. Got it. So we have another question which says, uh, have you ever shipped a feature which led to a significant production issue? And if yes, how did you resolve it? Mm. Or any team or any team member, any such instance where in shipping a feature caused an issue. So how did the team take it? So I think chat actually where we shipped it and I think it was the same day or the next day we had to... Uh, there was a huge CPU surge in our uh, servers okay. um, and we didn't know what was the reason actually. Was it chat or something else? It was yeah. the whole like kind of uh, product uh, app kind of uh, uh, showing us that, okay, you know, something is really consuming a lot of memory and, and we just suspected as the first one that, oh, we just launched. So the way we looked at it is what is the recent change that we've made, right? So we looked at, oh, chat is could be causing it because it's a, uh, the whole, the tech stack is new and, you know, a lot of things were completely new. Uh, and of course, the whole scale of the product was quite high there. So we took it down immediately because, and uh, like I said about the turn on and off switch, that really right. helped that, uh, you know, we, we immediately kind of turned it off. Uh, and, and there was not much damage because we had just probably launched it uh, that right. day or a day before. So that's what we did it. But uh, when we kind of, the, the whole tech team was kind of hands on on figuring out what went wrong and then we realized it was not chat it was something else okay <laughs> and uh, so, so that was i think a happy case there but we all kind of yeah. got just alarmed uh, that yeah. it could be because of that uh, and um, i think a very good way to handle that was that uh, that on and off switch there uh, but yeah yeah uh, so uh, so we have another question from Kirti. Which, uh, so what do you think about coming from the software software development background has helped you become a product manager? The, I think the biggest thing is problem solving. So like as engineers, we are always like geared to solve problems like, you know, through coding and uh, just think very scientifically there. Yeah. The logical thinking has really, really helped uh, as, uh, uh, as an engineer. Uh, and like not belittling the other functions, but it's it's yeah. just that we are kind of geared towards uh, that piece, uh, problem solving and logical. So that's something that has really, really helped me. The second thing is, of course, because you're day in and day out working with engineers, uh, you can really empathize with them better that, okay, you know, something really takes time. Yes, it, it does take time. And on the hindsight, also the other side, you can say that oh, someone, if, if you know that this is not going to take so much time, you can actually kind of, you know, question and maybe there are valid reasons for it but it's mainly you know like you know okay when you also have to kind of give an estimate to your uh, your business counterpart or even to your customer it helps you kind of figure out that okay these are the main components which might be impacted if we have to build this feature and then you can have your own calculation as well uh, a rough calculation i would say when you have a little bit of engineering background that okay this might take time correct so you can predict the timeline better yes yes got it uh, okay let's look had some more questions. So uh, one of the questions earlier was, uh, how do you em be better at embracing failures? Like a lot of company culture might not be okay with, you know, failures. It's very easy to say that, okay, we are okay with failing, but at yeah. the end of the day, we all know that it's a panic situation. A lot of things go wrong. So yeah. how do you become better as a product manager to embrace failure over like from being a young, young PM to a matured PM? So what did you transition into? Uh, I think first of all, 
like depends again on what type of failures they are yeah. like there could be very big failures right. as well uh, but i'm thinking when you are a new product manager you might not have that kind of a responsibility where it's right. a big failure but i uh, like i had mentioned in my slide as well that you know uh, first is admitting okay let's sure there is a failure here and uh, is it some like you kind of drilling down onto the root causes right what what could have gone and what could have been done better but it, yes you are right that a lot of it trickles down from your leadership and management on the culture as well that you know how much uh, they are open to failure and that's why i would suggest always have these experiments kind of that you know you're doing it on a very small scale so like to give an example we wanted to kind of launch a chatbot uh, on whatsapp Okay. where we did it only for like let's say 100 users just to hmm. see you know like because whatsapp is like pretty much like a customer service department was not really like very very uh, okay with that okay opening up like a floodgate for uh, yeah. users to kind of reach out to us so we did like a small experiment there uh, and have a chatbot to see how people are reacting to it and stuff like that so i think it's always try small so that you can't really reach that failure and and when you have real solid reasons of why it failed uh i think everybody kind of understands that uh and uh, like i mentioned about the two way do decisions also like something that yeah. you can revert it back uh, it's not a big thing unless you're really hurting your brand reputation it's a very big thing that you've lost like x dollars revenue yeah. you know million dollars of revenue uh but but that's at a very 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 late uh, or a big at a very higher strategic stage uh, i would say so um yeah i think uh, people do understand if you kind of admit it first i've seen that people have that empathy for you uh, than actually saying oh wait this is not me i have not done it he's done Correct. it like you know so it's just being like uh, more natural that like, you know you would always think of blaming people there but then it's uh, i think it's as a product manager yes you are the one who has to be responsible there uh, owning it be it a failure or a success there so so we, so a large part of the community is also are looking for to transition into product management role mm. so uh, so uh, one of the question was how, what does a normal day or a week look like for a product manager like stand ups or team team discussions or uh, brainstorming so how does your day look like uh, when you're working with let's say amazon prime mm mm-hmm. so how do how do you break up your day so uh, it it a lot a lot of it depends on what stage of your product is so if i have to walk you through the whole like let's say product life cycle you're starting with a concept there right so you know that this is a problem here which we kind of need to solve so a lot of product managers time during that phase of of uh, conceptualization uh, com- conceptualization and you know discovery is more inwards where you're trying to figure out things getting data and stuff like that you're working with your uh, product analyst your business analysts there right so so that's let's say that's the phase the second one is when you're actually going into execution right that's when the whole stand ups start working where you have a lot more collaboration and you know uh, coordination with your teams with your designers with your engineers uh, so that's where you have i think there it becomes like a 20 80 ratio where 20% is more like an inward where you're trying to uh, work on the next kind of set of features or you know trying to see what data you have from the previous launched feature uh and you have more of kind of uh making sure the things are you know streamlined are there any bottlenecks and you know if uh, how can you kind of make sure that the, the team is kind of on their own working on it so so that's the, the second phase and then after you've launched again i think it's an iterative process so it's pretty much the same and you're probably working more cross functionally with your marketing team your sales team so i would say it's it's very dependent on what phase you are at of the product and uh, also it's uh, like how cross functionally you are involved it depends to company to company as well so like for prime video uh like amazon being a mammoth company there were like 20 teams building just like one feature wow right so so and, and geographically distributed from japan india uk to seattle right so it, it's it's pretty much that way so so there then there's a different kind of challenges uh you have as well uh while you're working with the engineering team there versus let's say if you are in a company a smaller setup where everybody is with you so the the coordination is a little lesser there uh and uh, so there are different things depending on the scale of the company uh, phase of the project and stuff so i think whenever like you're entering into product management always try to understand what product management means in that company because mm. product management is very varied and i know from like companies who really want the product managers to code also so so and some really need strategic product managers where they only want people to kind of they want them to talk to customers and if you're going to a very high technical let's say a machine learning kind of a thing where there are 
machine learning experts and they would probably want you to not even enter into solutionizing there correct so is so it, it a lot of it depends on what that actually product and the company wants as a product manager so so and there was an interesting question so because you mentioned 20 teams who are working geographically distributed so as a product manager at amazon uh, how many concurrent projects do you have like uh, how many projects do you work on at any given point so uh, just one correction so i was a product marketing manager there okay. so my role was a little different there okay. uh, but when i've seen like a co- traditional product manager over there uh, it, it again it's very different uh, team to team depending on the scale of the product if it's a small feature let's say you're building something for acquisition there's a campaign that you need to run and get some small feature out on the landing page or the home page of the product and it something that you can do concurrently with the other things but if it let's say if you are launching a very huge thing let's say prime videos uh, uh, like a carousel on the prime video home page recommended for you for example so that's a huge feature there so then you will be probably be very very focused on to only delivering that and in fact there will be multiple teams doing that one thing right so right. okay uh, so we have five more minutes i think we can go on for five more minutes so i think people let me see what other questions i have to be covered so yeah uh, there was one question because the need i have hooked is so famous uh, as a resource for product management uh, are there any other resources which uh, you know uh, people should uh, look up to or read up read up for if they're looking to become a product manager any other resources mm. I think these webinars for sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because you get a lot of relatable context True. than the books. Uh, uh, from so I'm not a very heavy reader. I would uh, admit that. So hence, uh, definitely, I would always look at uh, uh, like of course Neeraj's books, and there are many other lean startup and uh, uh, other psychological books also, which kind of help as a product manager. Uh, but overall, I think uh, from resources point of view. um just kind of keeping yourself updated as a product manager really helps in terms of all the what are the new products that are happening what is your thought process what is your uh, like is it a good thing or a bad thing like evaluating yourself uh, uh, and uh, um, knowing what's uh, coming up in a uh, product and you know things are kind of changing so a lot of times these book help you with fundamentals but then they are also outdated in terms oh, of how oh, you're thinking okay. um and so hence i kind of Uh, look at more real uh, you know like a very uh, up to date kind of information and the best thing i feel is through experience is what you learn right so like even for failures like i said that uh, something uh, for product management specifically you you learn a lot from the experience so a lot of times it's if you have the passion for it kind of just be there like jump onto it right away uh, and and then you will learn it from there so uh, so let's see if we have a couple of more questions are there any insights which you can uh, share on consumer like you work as a product marketing manager at amazon uh, so any insights like how users behave like which you were not aware of while you were building the product but after doing some tests or research you found out okay this is how a particular it, it can be anything it can be anything basic as uh, people using a particular feature on amazon that mm. is there's an x-ray feature in the amazon prime plan mm-hmm. any any sort of insights which which you were uh, new to like when you joined amazon so a uh, one thing uh, um, that i found really really um, uh, as a miss i would say as when i was in, like in a in prime video team was since amazon prime video was always like built as a global is a global yeah. product serving 200 right. countries right so and i was owning the discovery experience of, okay. of the wow. content so basically the home page that you see uh, across the platforms so uh, uh, it was india was a very unique it is a very unique country when it comes to indian consumption right uh, uh, and when i say that it basically means that we are we kind of understand multiple languages uh, and we are very movie heavy kind of country where we consume a lot of uh, in amazon's language 3p content right uh, and and which is very different from the other countries right so when and that's like a challenge when you kind of trying to build a global product when oh. when you are trying to cater to so many countries and and you take any let's say you take italy you take brazil they have like one primary language so like as oh. a user if i show you like the home page my discovery yeah. as that's all the let's say all in it, italian or let's yeah. say german i'm good but yeah. as as an indian 
if i'm telugu i would want to see english also telugu also and maybe tamil because i understand that as yeah, well correct right. right so then there is this whole varied uh, so so hence language became a very important thing mm. which which i discovered were like or uh, there that you know uh, we got a lot of complaints on social media where you know people were uh, saying that oh i'm just seeing so much language like if i'm a hindi user i don't understand, understand. that tamil right so, and there's a lot of noise so so that's where we see that okay there was a huge opportunity there where you know and a gap that users would like to see only the language that they understand and then there is a lot of ways that we can kind of solve this problem but this was an insight that really came out clearly that you know uh, we have to have a filtering or some way of uh, onboarding or taking users preferences for the language there got it so i think yeah uh, i think we've covered almost all the questions so thanks a lot nirali for uh, taking the time on a saturday to join us and uh, uh, give us such beautiful insights about from your learning so yeah. we have another event coming up guys uh, which is on uh, which is next saturday Uh, we have Shantanu Singh from the news. Uh, Aditya just posted the link for that event uh, uh, in the chat, so you can register for that as well. So he's uh, worked at Grofers previously, so we'll be learning more insights about how on how to be a product manager. So that's it, guys. Thanks a lot for joining us.